Alrighty, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Romano and I'm one of the regional paramedic educators with Base Hospital. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar this morning on uh, acute coronary syndromes. Um, so the way this webinar works, if you haven't been able to join us yet for one, uh, you'll hear presenters speaking over top of a PowerPoint that you'll be seeing in the background. If you happen to have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, you'll see on your control box that on the bottom right hand side you have a questions or a chat box. And uh, what you can do is you can actually type in your questions into those boxes and Dave Usage, our education coordinator, will actually go ahead and, uh, and answer those questions for you. If you have questions at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll actually open up your microphones if you have one and uh, make it available to you to actually ask questions uh, by voice over top of the presentation. So, uh, I'd like to introduce, we have uh, Dr. Paul Bradford, one of our local medical directors, and Tony J, an ACP, and they'll be presenting uh, acute coronary syndromes, and, uh, and here's your webinar. Good to go. Good morning, everybody. Hi. My name's Tony. Um, I'm an ACP with uh, Essex Windsor EMS, and I'm also a paramedic instructor with uh, LHSC. And with me today is Dr. Paul Bradford, our local medical director. And we're going to present to you acute coronary syndrome. Now, um, a few months ago, Dr. Church and Dr. Lewell did a 12 lead STEMI webinar. And this is the other portion to it. So when you put the two together, you have the, acute, the entire acute coronary syndrome uh, presentation. So if uh, I'm good to go here, Doc, are you good to go? Yeah. All right, so we'll move forward. All righty. So um, our objectives today are to define what acute coronary syndrome is and locate and identify the coronary arteries and the section of the myocardium that they feed, uh, describe and identify the common signs and symptoms of left-sided and right-sided myocardial infarct, injury, and ischemia, and summarize the uh, pharmacology and the pharma, uh, pharmacodynamics of nitro, ASA, and morphine, and relate all this to our standing orders. All right. So what is ACS? Um, ACS is sudden ischemic disorders of the heart. Uh, it includes unstable angina and acute myocardial infarction. And it's represented by a continuum of a similar, a similar disease process and all have a sudden ischemia and you can't differentiate uh, in the first few hours and they all have the same initiating events. All right, uh, the initiating events of course is plaque rupture and then thrombus formation, and then vasoconstriction. All right, and the initial events. And as you can see here, we have two uh, cross-sections of arteries here. The first one is the stable one. And as you can see, here's the lumen. And outside the lumen is the lipid core, and it's pretty good distance away. Now, this one here is the vulnerable one because that fat core is sitting right on the lumen of the, of the uh, artery with this uh, fibrous cap and the lipid core coming in uh, contact with each other. So what happens first is the uh, there's plaque rupture. That's our first event. So as you can see, the lumen of the artery has ruptured. Oh, the lumen of the uh, artery has ruptured. And now we have an event here where bleeding is starting to occur. All right, so what happens when we bleed? Uh, platelets start to adhere to the, uh, to the spot where the tears occurred. And as you can see, the lumen itself is starting to get smaller here. And as we bleed further, more platelets start to adhere. And as you can see, our entire area now of, of uh, circulation is being vasoconstricted to the point where it becomes totally occluded and we have uh, fibrin that starts to, to occlude and keeping this big clot all together. And as you can see here, a third event is of course vasoconstriction where there's almost no blood flow past this point. All right, with acute coronary syndrome, will the infarct occur? Um, all these things start to happen here. We have collateral circulation, uh, plaque rupture, uh, increased MBO2, coronary vasoconstriction, and thrombus formation. It all leads to tissue death. 
the three I's, ischemia, which is the lack of oxygenation, injury, which is prolonged ischemia, and then infarct, which is death of tissue. So we have here a well-perfused uh, myocardium. As you can see, here's the coronary artery sitting on the epicardium itself of the, of the heart tissue. And everything is flowing through nice down through the endocardium, and the whole muscle itself is infused and has all those neat nutrients that are going through it. All right. As ischemia starts, we have some sort of blockage here. And as we come down further into the endocardium, this is where the ischemic events take place. So patients with present with chest pain and shortness of breath, and we give them nitrates to open this up and have all this endocardium here uh, perfused to alleviate their pain. All right, injury. Injury is where a thrombus is starting to form, and then we have a larger section here of ischemic events going on. And as you can see, it's, it's a pretty big portion of the left ventricle that's, that's, a, that's being um, affected here. So um, again, with our, with our morphine nitro ASA and O2, should alleviate this issue here. Right, and of course, infarction, where you can see in the black here, we have an occlusion up top in the left coronary artery, and this whole area is not being perfused, and tissue death is starting to occur. So this is a big MI right here. All right, coronary artery anatomy varies from patient to patient, and there's always general patterns of uh, distribution uh, that, per, that are uh, present. So we'll start with the, with the left ventricle, the left coronary artery, and as you can see, down the septal wall and the entire left anterior face. And we have the left coronary main, the left circumflex, um, uh, which, which takes care of the left lower wall, and of course the anterior. All right. And on the right side here, we have the right coronary artery, which takes care of the entire right ventricle. All right. So signs and symptoms of uh, left coronary occlusion um, is the ACS spectrum. Um, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, pulmonary edema. All right, right coronary artery. And we can see here, um, there's the proximal, uh, posterior, uh, descending artery, the posterior wall, and the inferior wall. So it takes care of all the right side. All right, signs and symptoms. We have dyspnea with clear lungs, uh, jugular vein distension, and hypotension. And the hypotension can be either relative or absolute. All right, so two different that signs symptoms going on here. All right, uh, acute coronary syndrome. Uh, now we need to know how to rapidly recognize and treat ACS. All right, so the immediate evaluation is, of course, the story, the patient's risk factors, and what does the ECG show? All right, and our presentations are, they're either classical anginal uh, chest pain, atypical chest pain, and angel equivalence. And this one here we're going to focus on a little bit more too as we go, as we go along here. All right, these, ones, these two are pretty easy. <clears throat> What's classical uh, angina? It's central anterior chest pain. It could be dull, full, pressure, tightness, crushing, and radiates to arms, neck, and back. This one here we always deal with and uh, we can recognize quite early. Um, so here's a case study. Consider the following case study. You have a 48-year-old male he has chest pain, which is 2 out of 10. It's dull. It began while he was at rest. He's pale, wet. He's overweight. Uh, weight. Uh, he's a smoker. And as you can see, his vitals here aren't really too bad. All right. Atypical chest pain uh, is either musculoskeletal, it's positional, or pleuritic features. It's often unilateral, so one-sided. It may be described as sharp or stabbing. It includes epigastric discomfort, and females often express as atypical. Now, atypical, usually there's always something else involved. Um, uh, it's usually they have diabetes or they have another underlying illness. And again, it's, it's with the females. And these are the ones that we also treat with uh, in the ACS uh, spectrum. So let me just kind of, I don't mind if I talk here, tell me a little bit. But, uh, you know, this, uh, I think this is a big quandary, uh, a big uh, uh, landmine for paramedics, the atypical uh, uh, presentation of acute coronary syndrome and and uh, you know I, I think there's a lot of literature uh, out there which uh, is confusing the medics um, you know, the initial teaching and training was always if, uh, if if it was tender to touch the chest wall you know they can go home it's just uh, a muscular injury and and you can exclude them and uh, that was 
that was taught to us uh, for years. And really, I would say that the education aspect of this has changed in the, uh, in the uh, art and stroke in, in the last 10 or 15 years. And, and there's good evidence now showing that 15% uh, you know, of patients having an acute MI uh, will have chest wall tenderness on palpation. And so, I mean, I think that we have to take that uh, with a grain of salt now when you're able to, you know, touch on the chest wall and feel that as, as a medic. And, and I, I also, you know, this is everybody's. This isn't just diabetics. This isn't just, uh, you know, females or, or this is all comers, um, which I, I think, uh, you know, we should, we should definitely uh, pay close attention to. The other thing is, um, you know, as, as we get older, we, uh, we change in our presentation. And, and uh, you know, that varies from um, the actual chest being the focus of, of the symptoms you're having to, you know, epigastric area, stomach vomiting might be the issue. Or the patient just may look very diaphoretic, uh, may uh, seem confused. In fact, and often in elderly patients, they may present with, you know what, they're just not themselves. They're just not acting differently than they normally do. And, and I think the feeling is that this is a catecholamine release um, that is affecting the patient. So they're, they're having a, an MI for whatever reason, as you spoke to on the slides 14 and 15 earlier, um, either an acute event or with a clot formation uh, that is causing adrenaline release, catecholamine release in their body, which is giving them this constellation of symptoms, including you know, the sweating, the shortness of breath, um, the anxiety, the anxiousness, that type of thing and uh, confusion. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, you know, when 911 is called and you're dispatched to those calls, you might be dispatched to, hey, we've got an 85-year-old male who's confused. Or we've got a, you know, a 78-year-old male with general weakening condition. And, and these, this is the trap, I think. I think people get you know, dispatched to these calls and they're labeled. You already kind of got a, a pre uh, idea before you go in of what you know I'm going to be facing and you know it's probably not something with a UTI or something like that and I think as clinicians we have to kind of broaden our scope and say okay you know what this could be an MI and, and, and leave ourselves more open uh, to making that diagnosis because these, these, these patients can be much more, more, more tricky. The other um, interesting uh, point was a slide you had where you showed there was a partial clot in the epi, uh, epicardial area where there's actually still some flow taking place. And, um, and, and what you have in that situation is you have partial flow getting through. And uh, in, this, in, in this situation, if you increase myocardial demand, uh, then you're going to get some cardiac ischemia. And this is an alternate presentation of acute coronary syndrome, which I think medics see quite a bit of. Someone uh, who is, say, 75, 80, who's presenting with rapid atrial fibrillation, say. And so all of a sudden, their heart rate's up to 160, 140, 160. They finally call EMS, the palpitations, or, or they may not necessarily feel their heart rate racing, but they may feel palpitations. And now you've got basically this old person on a treadmill for four or five hours doing a marathon. And then that partial um, stenosis is, uh, is resulting in uh, areas of, of, the, uh, of the heart now not getting blood, uh, enough blood flow. And they're actually developing uh, um, some ischemia in that area. So, so those are examples of, hey, you know, this isn't um, giant ST elevation MI with a, you know, an elephant on my chest going down my left arm. Um, uh, but they're, they're, I think they're commonly seen by medics every day, and I think that's what that's what should be the take home here uh, on this on this aspect of atypical pain. Absolutely, and a good general rule of thumb there is that most of us, what we practice is that we show up to a call and the patient's having discomforts basically from the eyebrows to the knees. Um, a 12 is going in place. I mean, we're doing the ECGs and such that you do them probably right away. So either rule in or rule it out. Um, well, I think, I mean, yeah. you know, EKG changes may take yeah. eight hours. And, That's right. And uh, in fact, we just going to hand a question here. Can, uh, can we explain uh, during an acute coronary syndrome event with atypical chest pain, uh, how can they have a normal, uh, how can they have a normal EKG? And uh, I think uh, uh, what we have to remember is to actually change the uh, ST segment or T-wave segment, uh, you actually have to uh, have enough um, area of the myocardium, which is in the, the in line with that EKG lead, uh, to actually move move that uh, elevation up or down. And so um, that will definitely happen after infarction, but during the ischemic phase, um, it may be uh, several hours, depending on the amount of demand, to get enough of the myocardium involved to, to generate that. Um, to, to, to generate that lead change. And certainly we see 
people having repeat cardiac enzymes and emerge where uh, their second EKG might have a flip T um, uh, six, eight, six or eight hours or their seventh or eighth EKG may have a change. And so as a medic, I think it's important, yeah, the EKG can help you at the scene and certainly, uh, you know, you, you know, can put it together and, wow, you know, this has been going on for a few hours and I can see this as the medic. But what you don't want to get into is uh, coming in with someone with some vomiting, doing an EKG and saying, well, everything looks fine to us uh, and then no servicing the person. You know, not that I'm sure that happens, but I'm just saying that, you know, I, I think relying on the EKG is the gold standard. I think that you know we can we can show and demonstrate why that's not why that's bad practice. Oh, absolutely! And one thing that's very important is that uh, a normal ECG does not rule out ACS. So everything comes back and looks okay, but the story fits the picture. Mm -hmm. Using one of these presentations, and you've got you know an ACS patient on your hands, dead toes ruled out. And again, like like Dr. Bradford stated here, that could be eight nine hours down the road. So if you're thinking it. Um, I mean, absolutely, go ahead and treat as such, too, so very good. And this is, this is the most difficult one, I think. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think medics, yeah. you know, medics have a habit of just saying to, you know, um, something's wrong with this one. I'm thinking cardiac in this case just by looking at somebody. Exactly. You know, and, and they may not have, you know, they may have some foreign language or they, you know, or, they, or the words may escape them at the time to appropriately express this acute cardiac syndrome. Right. But there's medics who have been out there on the road who can just look at someone and say, you know, I think that's an LI. And, and it's like, it's amazing to me that they have that ability, or 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 a triage nurse, the same thing. You know, wow, I think this guy's out of MI, and uh, wow, they haven't even said anything yet. You know, so I think there's a look. I don't know if it's an anxious look or the diaphoresis, or you know, um, or, or just that that uh, ability to have a lot of experience. You know, and uh, pattern recognition, but um, you know, certainly uh, there it's not. It's, it's certainly not as simple as uh, left side of chest pain. That's you right. Know? Exactly. Exactly. All right. Very good. So I'm a little bit forward here. So here's a, here's a case study involving a 54-year-old female. She has got type 2 diabetes, hypertension. She's complaining of chest pain. She's weak and fatigued. But her chest pain is pleuritic in nature, and it worsens with movement and deep breathing. When she's motionless, the pain completely resolves. So, I mean, her history is strong, um, and she's following into this atypical pain. I mean, her vitals all look pretty good, but, I mean, are you going to treat as ACS? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so... It's tough. It's tough. I mean, the Framingham study, um, you know, way back in the, in the 80s when they took that village and, and kind of monitored everybody, showed that uh, um, basically one-fourth of all MIs are silent. Absolutely. You know, when they say are silent MIs without chest pain or other symptoms. Now, I mean, you know, maybe these people had some indigestion, maybe they had something, but basically they didn't have anything really giant in their life to call 911. And, and, and one quarter, 25% is a lot. It's a huge. And so then you've got the people way over the other side are having the classic you know, and, uh, and and we have to put that together, and we have to ignore sometimes what the dispatch is telling us as the reason why we're there. You know, absolutely. And I think that's that's the challenge. And and just to stress on Dr. Bradford's uh, point, there is that how do we do that? Ask the questions. Don't ask the leading questions. Have the patient answer questions for you, mm -hmm. and then you can start putting this whole picture together. And if you're going down the ACS rope because that's the way it looks, then treat as such. So. All right. Very good. So angelo equivalents. Um, so these these are the ones that present with dyspnea. They have palpitations. They're syncopal or they're presyncopal. They're generally weak or they're DKA patients. All right. Um, classical uh, angel um, angelo equivalents. So you have a 68 year old female, sudden onset of anxiety. And she's restless. States she can't get your breath. Denies any chest pain or discomforts. Strong histories involved here. She's insulin dependent diabetic. Uh, she's got hypertension. And as you can see, her vitals, again, aren't, you know, outstanding or anything impressive there. All right, so which way do we go with this? Um, again, as Paul stated, um, everything points down the ACS road and tree as such. I think, I think there's, a trap, there's a trap in these patients in that, you know, if you look at your um, diabetic patient who's really, you know, not presenting you with any chest symptoms or, um, you know, chest pressure, but, uh, you know, you've got that glucometer and it's uh, 30 or not reading because uh, it's so high, um, you know, you should keep that in mind. And where the trap is, like sometimes these type 2s and, um, and uh, who are on insulin, uh, you know, who've had the disease longer or, or um, the insulin fed diabetics, sometimes they're not always the smallest people in the world. You know That's what I mean? Right. Sometimes they're the 300-pounder or the 200-pounder, you know, 250, something like that. You know, and so there's a tendency to not want to carry that patient, you know, like to kind of say, you know what, you got your, you know, let's get you with a walk into the stretcher or that type of thing. 
and there's a trap there because then later on that you know but sometimes they lead to complaints, right? Because later on we find out that they're an MI, their sugar was high, we do a workup, we do the APG, we find out, oh, actually they're infarcting. And then you end up with, uh, oh, wow, like, you know, this, uh, you know, when they came to the house, they made my dad walk down the stairs and because uh, he was so heavy and, you know, he was really sweaty and we thought he was going to fall on everybody. And, you know, and that's, that's the kind of story you get because they're not presenting as we're, I think a medic would never do that as someone presenting with uh, chest pain going down the left arm and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so you can end up kind of, being led down the path of, of going the, on, the, on the dark side, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and then uh, that's, that's where this could bring you, you know, and, uh, is that fact that these patients, you know, uh, don't present that way and yet they are, they could be having a big, uh, a big clinical event which is going to get a lot of attention, a lot of care at the hospital mm -hmm. immediately right away, mm -hmm. uh, whereas perhaps the pre-hospital care uh, can sometimes be more relaxed, you know, in, in that situation. And one thing too I want to stress with diabetes here and the chest pain issue um, is that remember that this disease wipes out the pain receptors. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing going up the you know, spinal column into the brain stem or the medulla telling the body that look you're having pain. Yeah. So that's gone. Right? So that's a really good point. I mean, especially especially after ten years of disease, you get the autonomic neuropathy, but you can also get, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, as a, you know, we know the peripheral neuropathy, but with the autonomic sense you know, you, you know that patients sometimes uh, um, have trouble uh, moving their food along their bowel and have uh, very brittle uh, sugars. And at that point is where you really start to see um, some decreased sensation around the uh, cardiac pain fibers mm -hmm. and uh, in the mediastinum. Um, and uh, it might just be that there's an altered mental state or the sugars to, to clue you in. Very good. All right, so important notation is uh, note the exact time of symptoms when they began and duration of symptoms may be therapeutic options and destination decisions. Now the one here is uh, we're on that three hour uh, episode or that four hour window with acute coronary syndrome. Four. Oh, four hours, sorry. Four hours. Four? Yeah. Sorry. Um, for um, thrombolytics, correct? No, we're, you're uh, thinking of stroke, I think. Oh. The change in the stroke. Right. Oh, you just did that to trick me. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, so uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, so, so basically, um, if you've got you know you've got really 12 hours before the intervention becomes riskier than uh, than really not doing anything, right? So you know the exact time is sometimes hard to pick because people, when you ask them, I want, well, the chest pain began at 10 o'clock and uh, we called 911 at 10:30, and then when you actually ask them more, when the next day they're asking them more questions on route, they go, well, actually at 4 a.m. I had some pain, but it kind of went away, and then it's sort of this start and stuttering stepwise kind of infarct that happens where there may be kind of a little bit of a 90%, 95% inclusion and the clock, you know, blows by and then uh, it may uh, infarct a little later. And, and what we found is that we actually have in our bodies endogenous um, thrombolytic, right? So we actually are making clot, breaking down clot all the time. And so uh, when these people have these kind of tight lesions and then boom, they clot that day, you know, there could be kind of uh, what they call crescendo angina symptoms, right, so that they can actually have a stepwise increase in their symptomatology. Um, and, uh, and so, and then there's sort of a, a point where it becomes so bad that they call 911. So, so it's, it, we, we definitely want the exact time, but sometimes we know that that's hard. And sometimes people aren't always clear, you know, and especially, and, and I think where you bring this out with the stroke analogy is exactly, because it's amazing how often that they tell the medic it exactly started this time, and then they get to the hospital, then the time moves. Um, in the case of MI, um, you know, the, we want to basically get the thrombolytic in, in, in from our end of it in the hospital within 30 minutes, right? I mean, we definitely want to do that. And if you're going to be doing primary care angioplasty, which many centers are doing now, some of you are having to make these decisions in the field and bypass your local hospital to get to a, a, a primary uh, angioplasty site, um, you know, we want the balloon up in 90 minutes, right? And, uh, and so knowing the exact time and being able to risk stratify that is, is critical. And uh, because after a certain amount of time, it then becomes riskier for the patient because the intervention, you know, of, of, of getting thrombolytic is actually, you know, uh, cerebral bleeds and things like that, which are actually worse uh, than, uh, you know, the chance of survival. And, and really, you know, from a medic point of view, I mean, we have all these interventions and they all, you know, it's all wonderful and sexy and all new and, and getting a lot of press attention. But, you know, you've got to remember that when you're giving the aspirin pre-hospital, that is equal to the intervention um, uh, added by thrombolytics. So, so you know, uh, basically, even back in uh, even back in the 90s, um, in ISIS II, uh, when we gave uh, aspirin, um, it decreased it uh, decreased mortality by 23 percent, and then when we gave thrombolytic, it decreased it by 42 percent. 
um, as well as aspirin. So basically, the intervention step, the decrease in mortality you get is 23% by aspirin. And then doing these new interventions and all this other sexy stuff gives you another 23%. So if you don't get the aspirin, if you don't, if you don't pay attention to these subtle cues of this acute coronary syndrome, and it's all from a presentation, if you're not doing that, you're actually robbing the patient of like half their chance of survival. You know, so um, I think the pre-hospital piece of this is huge. You know, for oh, I agree with you. And then we'll, as we get further down, and we'll talk about ASA and morphine and all those nice things we have, and I'll come back and I'll stress this point about ASA. It's the most important intervention, absolutely, that we have out of all these nice things that we have available to us. You know. And again, like Paul, uh, Dr. Bradford said as well, the destination decisions too, I mean, um, if you think this patient should be going to a STEMI uh, location, then you go ahead and call your BHP. Give them the picture, give her the picture, and, uh, and see what happens from there. Very good. All right, so also consider the risk factors. These are huge, all right? Um, it's evaluated with a high index suspicion for ACS. And it's also a decision pathway with potential ACS patients. And it might be something that's very simple, but it's very important as given ASA. The patient presents as atypical um, presentation or a classical or an angel um, equivalent uh, presentation. And it's getting on the phone with a doc and saying, look, and you get ASA on board, absolutely. So very, very important. And the other one here, too, is family history. That's a huge one as well. All right, so here, here are some of the risk factors, and these, and these are the big ones, all right? So diabetes, smoking, hypertension, age, uh, age uh, this is absolutely huge, and this should probably come up up to here, too, although these aren't in any particular order. Um, obesity, stress, and, uh, and a sedentary lifestyle. I think, I think where this comes in, in a practical sense is in the field is like, okay, I got chest pain going down my arm. Okay, you're there. You're, not, you're thinking, absolutely. sorry, right? But when I'm like, I've got some tingling and numbness, you know what I mean? And, it kind of is in my neck and, you know, something more subtle, then these risk factors are going to maybe up your threshold, right? And I think that's the way, um, you know, that's the way you have to kind of incorporate that into your practice and say, okay, well, so then what, yeah, the guy, the guy who, or, the, or, the, or the woman who's got the obvious cardiac thing or I've had four MIs, well, fine, you know they've got disease, right? Yeah. But this person with this vague kind of symptomatology, I was playing basketball and then I kind of, I don't know, kind of felt weak and I kind of almost passed out. That's kind of big, right? Like that's not really jumping out as our mind, other than they were exerting themselves. And then you start getting into this, and you realize, well, wow, they got a whole bunch of these that are positive. You say, you know what, man? Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe um, open up my my differential, my my my, my pre-hospital care to, to open it up to acute coronary syndrome with this patient because, um, you know, of all these risk factors coupled with this presentation. You know, Absolutely. I think that's the way you got to take that information and, and throw it out the door. Perfect. All right. So general therapy for ACS and. Um, First of all, we want to expose the chest, get the story, risk factors, and somewhere in between we do our assessments, our treatments come into play. So as you can see, uh, when I do my assessments and treatments, the O2 and the ASA are almost right at the same time. And then I worry about the IV, the nitro, and the morphine, right? So we're exposing the chest, we're getting the story, um, monitor 12 lead, and do not let the 12 lead be your decision maker as to whether you're going to treat, all right? Um, the, the story itself, the presenting, the presenting uh, factors um, should start getting you down the road of this treatment here. And then when you get that 12 that's great. All right. Uh, of course, your vital signs to make sure that you're in the parameters for treating, especially with your vasodilators here. And these ones here are actually in hospital, right? So we don't do, we don't do those in the field. All right. So how do we treat? We treat with O2, IV, ASA, nitro, and morphine. Uh, of course, out there we're known the acronym MONA, but of course we don't treat in that order. Um, and MONA being morphine, ASA, uh, nitro, and oxygen. So it's kind of the way we go down here. That's MANO. I know. <laughs> All right, well. Morphine, oxygen, <laughs> therapy, yeah. Anyway. How do we want to remember? Anyway, I like, I, like, I like your approach on that because I like the fact that, you know, the, the oxygen, which I think, you know, the new... Uh, heart and stroke guidelines may change how much oxygen we're giving, which might be helpful when I run as much in the tanks, but you know, there will be more to follow on that. I think Dr. Luwal is going to be doing a presentation mm -hmm. on how that may incorporate the uh, pre-hospital care later. But, but I think the aspirin has got to be in there up front. You know, I really do. And you get asked this all the time, should you give aspirin first, you give nitro first, which one? And it's kind of vague. And everything. I, I like giving aspirin first uh, because that changes mortality, right? Uh, nitro doesn't change mortality. It doesn't change your risk of dying from this, doesn't. Uh, that doesn't stop that. And, and you know, nitro is helpful as symptom relief. It, it makes the patient feel better and certainly can help, right? But it doesn't change your chance of dying. 
And some people, when you give them nitro, will not feel well, right? So they will have a headache or they will suddenly drop their pressure. And then what I worry about is then someone's going to give me aspirin and then they're going to hurl up the aspirin because they don't feel well and they're not going to chew the aspirin or I feel bad, I don't want to take the aspirin now. So I would, I would recommend giving the aspirin first. And the absorption on that is in 20 or 30 minutes if it's chewed, right? So, so I think that's, you know, that's, I think, critical right away. And, and, you know, if you think about your scene time and your transport time, that could already be functioning and working at the hospital. And we've certainly had cases where the pre-hospital EKG is showing an infarct. They get into emergency, they do an EKG, and they, and they said to me, your guys don't know how to do EKGs. Because, look, there's a show on MI and ours is fine. And you're like, well, hello. Like, they've treated the patient and cured you know, you're the oh, MI. Wow. You know, they've had the guy for 30 minutes. They've treated him. They've given him oxygen. They've given him the aspirin. They have fixed him. You know, don't send the guy home. He's got like a 90% lesion or something going on there. He needs a, you know, he's a cat. And so, so I think we we've seen the success of this. You got to remember that with your MIs, that you know, uh, 10 to 20% acutely will not have um, an elevation of cardiac markers that they will reperfuse, right? So they will reperfuse, and you will have no. They will actually what they they, they do. They, the technical word for it is abort. The MI will be aborted, so they're infarcting, but it's aborted, and there's actually no cardiac damage, and that will happen. And from pre-hospital care, you can increase that number, you know, um, before we get them. So very good. Also known as a, of a heart save, correct? So the heart self save. So yeah. very good. And just one thing I want to point out that Dr. Bradford touched on is uh, is coming back with normal ECGs. I mean, you you vasodilate these patients, and all of a sudden you start seeing like minor elevations or even big tombstone type elevations on, on your 12 lead come back to normal to baseline that's because well what happened is that uh, you've opened them up right and then you starting to perfuse that endocardium all right all right so there again there's our treatment for a, a ACS so or O2 or oxygen or IV therapy nitro and our morphine mano yeah mano it's mano how do you want mono yeah. mano mono yeah yeah good <laughs> but we're not doing in that order no, no, no. yet <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll go over our directive now, right? So um, we're looking at ischemic uh, chest pain, angina, or angina, typical angina with MI pain, and our nitro doses of 0 0.4 milligrams, six doses max, regardless of what the patient's taking themselves, and as long as they fit the uh, the vital parameters. So we're going to continue that nitro. All right. And again, I want to stress too, too. So let's say um, you completely alleviated their chest pain. And all of a sudden, they start again while you're while the patient's with. So we start all over from scratch again. And of course, uh, most important is the ASA intervention: 160 milligrams, one dose. Uh, have them put it into their uh, mouth, chewed up mainly up in, into the buccal fold. So let them uh, absorb that way. And then um, we're doing what we can for them. Good. So conditions for nitro, uh, are patients greater to or equal than 40 kilos, uh, make sure the patient's alert and responsive, uh, prescribed and taken nitro in the past, or paramedic has started an IV, all right, uh, very important, no uh, erectile dysfunctional meds in the past 48 hours, uh, maintaining systolic blood pressure greater to or equal than 100 uh, millimeters of mercury, and of course keeping the heart rates between 60 and 160. And, and you know the erectile dysfunction thing. I mean, it just lowers your blood pressure. You right. right? drug. It doesn't like it, you don't explode, right? I mean, like you know, some people are. Uh, I don't think they know what happens with it, you know. But it is a hypo, a big hypotension risk, right? And uh, you know, it's not like the guy's going to spontaneously combust. But you want to be careful about it. Sometimes people aren't always forthcoming, you know. Right. Type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, an important point here too is that um, dealing with that issue there. If if you're thinking down nitro, and of course if you're IV certified then have that in place as well. All right. All right. So our conditions for ASA. Uh, our patient is uh, equal to or greater than 40 kilos. The patient's alert and responsive. Uh, that's just to make sure the gag reflex is intact there. They have no allergies to ASA or any NSAIDs. Uh, no current active bleeding. Uh, no evidence of CVA or head injury in the, in the last 24 hours. And a previous use of ASA with no adverse reaction if a known asthmatic. So if they're asthmatic but they take ASA, then go ahead and give it. Right? And again, this, this interaction here should be done, I mean, I mean, our primary survey takes, what, 10 seconds, and then we do a nice thorough secondary. There is a minute to a minute and a half. So within that two or three minute range, uh, if, the, if the conditions warrant ASA, then we should be giving it at this time frame. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the asthmatic issue, I mean, there's people that 
get severe um, exacerbations of their asthma with an NSAID, but they're quite rare, you know, and I think if they've, you know, taken an Advil or ibuprofen for some kind of injury before and had no trouble with NSAIDs, then, you know, I, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think too many people are taking aspirin generally, you know, nowadays. Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of a, an old thing to do, you know, I mean, uh, you know, that, that our mothers did to us. I don't think, you know, nowadays uh, people are going and buying a bottle of aspirin for their uh, headache, you know, mm -hmm. so they'll probably be less experienced with it, you know, from, uh, uh, from uh, understanding how it affects them, you know, because they may have never had it before. Right. All right, so our procedure is O2. Uh, the monitor gets some baseline vitals. Uh, don't delay treatment to start an IV, and again, don't delay treatment to get a to get a 12 lead. All right. If you have no IV, uh, then administer nitro only in patients with a history of previous nitro use, and what that means, they've had their own nitro. So, if uh, I was to give somebody a nitro spray and they've never had that before, and all of a sudden they get chest pain, they can't be treated with nitro. All right. Um, nor does if they walked out of their doctor's office with a script for nitro. All right, so they've had to have their own nitro, their own use, and we go ahead and we can treat with nitro. All right, our procedure. So again, the patient's systolic blood pressure is greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. Their heart rate lies between 60 and 160 beats per minute. And how do we give it? We give it 0.4 sprays every uh, five minutes to a max of six doses. Uh, again, the ASA comes into place, it's 160 milligrams, and then a 12 lead if certified. Yeah, and you got to remember too, if you're out, once you're out, you're out. So if you're out, yeah. and then you come back in the That's parameters, right. the way our way we've done it regionally yeah. is that uh, you, know, you can't really have any more. That's you know? right. So because sometimes that's confusing. Uh, uh -huh. and, and also, I think with that is that you're comfortable with your vitals. So for instance, you know, the elbow was bent or there was some kind of, you know, they're jammed in the toilet and you pull them out and you get a one blood pressure, you're not, you think that's a fake blood pressure, that's, that's not right, you know, 170 over 150, that's, 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 right. that's wrong, you know. And so you're comfortable that's an accurate, uh, accurate, <laughs> accurate representation of their vitals. Because yeah. uh, don't be afraid of that, just talk to them about, you know, hey, you know what, I don't think that first test is right, this is what I'm going by, you know, hey, that's no problem, they have no problem with that. So. And just to stress the point that uh, Dr. Babbage just mentioned here, that uh, at any time, especially, I mean, giving our basal dilator, so this is, this is nitro and for the, for the ACPs out there, the morphine, should the patient ever fall out of the parameters and then come back in again, then of course we will stop giving the nitro and the morphine or any basal dilators. All right, so very important, we uh, take the vital signs before and after each dose, stop the nitro if systolic blood pressure drops more than one-third, and just a little point on there, if, um, if you think, if this has happened here, then you're probably looking at a right-sided MI or a right-sided event, all right? Discontinue the nitro if the vital signs fall outside the parameters, and if required and certified, follow the uh, IV access fluid administration protocol. And it's good. I mean, uh, it's a general kind of, if the blood pressure drops a lot, mm -hmm. stop giving it. I mean, I don't think we're, you know, not everybody's good at fractions. Right? That's right. You know what I mean? There's a people want to struggle a little bit, and I don't think we're like, all right, you know, yeah. very good. All right, so uh, the chest pain fully resol resolves and then recurs. It's treated as, as a new episode. Uh, the nitro protocol is repeated, but not the ASA. Uh, administer ASA if the patient has already taken the normal dose and administer the ASA even if the chest pain has resolved. So why, why do we say that they got to take it if they ever took the normal dose? Well, we don't know when they took it, right? We so, don't know when they took it, exactly. yeah, you want it in that uh, time frame. Pe people uh, lie. That's right. Patients lie because they want right. to look like they took their pill, even that's though they didn't, right? You know, they want to be like, and sometimes sometimes they're interrupted, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, they may be taking it every other day, mm -hmm. or they may have hurled it up, right? You know, that's the other thing, right? So that's we're right. going to get them to chew it, so the absorption is going to be quicker. So even if they took their enteric coat of aspirin, mm -hmm. you know, an hour ago, that won't be absorbed as fast as if you, uh, you know, chewed up to the aspirin. So. All right. So uh, for the ACPs only here, uh, we're going to get into uh, morphine. So when do we give it? Uh, after the third dose of nitro and if the patient is still complaining of chest pain. Again, uh, there will be no allergies to morphine sulfate. And maintaining a systolic blood pressure greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. And we give two milligrams of uh, morphine, uh, IV, Q, five minutes, maintaining a blood pressure greater than 100 uh, millimeters of systolic, and the patient and the pain is not being relieved. Uh, we give up to a total of max of uh, five doses, so 10 milligrams, uh, nitro maximum six doses, and if we need to continue these on, then we of course call our BHP for further orders if required.
Excellent. I mean, I think I think having the pain controlled and getting the anxiety, the anxiolytic effect of the morphine Absolutely. is critical. And where I really see a big effect on this is the patient with uh, chest pain, uh, angina, resulting in flash palm edema. You know, you basically got that wicked high blood pressure uh, um, uh, situation going on, uh, where you know it's that three o'clock in the morning call where they've got sleep apnea and they just. Uh, you know, snored themselves down and woken themselves up with a giant, giant adrenergic surge, right? You're like, you know, where they basically uh, feel like they're asphyxiated and they wake up and they get this sudden high, high blood pressure. The heart's trying to pump against this wall and then they results in some having some chest pain and then they get some backup and then they're, you know, got this flash palm edema. The other time you see this is uh, uh, people aspirate when they sleep. They have the giant pizza, beer, dinner, and then about 3 a.m. it's, you know, in their lungs, wakes them up and then as another giant asthmatic surge, you know, where they have, you know, not only the aspiration effect, but also this the same type of thing can happen. And then what I love about this is the morphine uh, just lowers that, um, you know, that, that, that blood pressure and, and the relaxation effect, uh, the anxiolytic effect takes away their own their own uh, catecholamine production, which lowers that uh, the the wall lowers the uh, the blood pressure and the afterload. And then the heart can do its job and, and pump everything through. And sometimes uh, the pre-hospital effect with that and BiPAP is amazing. You know, and, and just to know that, Dr. Bradford, what morphine, what it does uh, as far as the uh, anxiolytic effects is that uh, those catecholamines, which is norepinephrine, epinephrine, I mean, once that hits the, uh, the, the cardiac tissue, we all know what that does, all those positive ionotropics and dromotropics and dromotropics. Mm -hmm. This will take care of that portion for you so they don't have, like, those fast heart rates and those strong heartbeats and all that jazz. So it's a good point. Very good point. All right, so summary. Uh, acute coriceum is a sudden ischemic disorder of the heart, including unstable angina and acute, co acute myocardial infarction. It can resolve uh, or can involve ischemic injury, injury or infarct, and rapid recognition and treatment is vital for the best possible outcome for the patient. All right, so your three eyes, ischemic injury and infarct. All right. Any questions? You can contact uh, the Southwest Regional Base Hospital Program, the number there, or you can email them at the email address there. So, if uh, Dave you guys has have any questions, really, if Dave has some stuff for us, uh, we'll answer them for you. Okay. Um, thanks, Paul and Tony. Uh, we've got a couple questions still sitting out here, but as well, anybody that would like to ask a question, you should be able to see a button there that you can uh, raise your hand. If you do that, we'll click and open your mic. We'll bring you into the system and allow you to ask questions uh, live over the air. Bet you we get a question about nano, nano or nemo, mono. How are we going to do it? But remember, it's always oxygen. Okay, so uh, Jay Loosley, uh, you there? Hey guys, I'm here. Great. Morning, Jay. Um, I don't. Morning, everyone. I don't have a question about nano or mano. <laughs> Call wait one. But um, my question is with uh, a pain that increases more in inspiration. A lot of times, some of the guys that were trained a long time ago will ask the question, you know, "Does pain increase more in inspiration?" And after the answer is yes, then see you later, not cardiac. Have a nice day. Um, we've always taught that almost up to 25% of MIs um, show with increased pain with inspiration. Is that true? And is it more so with the inferior wall MIs that have pain that tends to increase a bit with inspiration? There's no, there's no, uh, there's evidence showing that, uh, as you said, a percentage of people will have pleuritic pain uh, with their MI. Um, there's no um, evidence. That's, uh, that it relates to any specific type of MI or um, that you can rule it out if, it, uh, if it's uh, with inspiration. So, you know, I think, I think, to be fair, there was a lot of training on this years ago that, you know, you can rule this out, and including in emerge, you know, that, that people will be sent home, you know, oh, it's tender there, you can go, or does it hurt when you breathe? Oh, well, yeah, nothing to worry about then. And, and unfortunately, it was wrong, <laughs> you know, so... I think uh, if you're on one of those calls, I think you need to step in and say, you know what, uh, the newest uh, the newest evidence is showing we need to be concerned about this, and I think we should roll this guy in. Sounds good. Thanks.
Okay, just looking for anybody else who actually wanted to ask a question live. We did have one question here, Paul, that uh, came up in the chat box, but maybe you can just address it. If the patient started with, say, 8 out of 10 pain and then decreased after 3 nitro down to 2 out of 10, would you still start your morphine protocol? I, I leave that up to the judgment of the medic. Um, you know, they, they may look at how the, uh, uh, the blood pressure is going and there may be other, other issues involved. And, uh, you know, I think either answer is correct. You know, and uh, as long as they're documenting, uh, you know, what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, I'm happy either way. Um, I don't think they have to uh, um, uh, specifically, they feel they've had a pretty good response with the nitro, but, or, you know, sometimes they get to a point where, like, it was eight, and then two, and then two, and then, you know, they're just not getting any more progress with it. I, I don't fault that, as long as I see that explained in these. Yeah. Absolutely, and another thing, too, is that uh, you could be looking at a time frame issue, too. Let's say you just arrive at the ER, right? And uh, by the time you're gonna pull your morphine out and get it cut, uh, within that time frame, you could probably get one more spray of nitro in there. So just document that. Did you get four sprays of nitro, and that's why you didn't get morphine. I think as long as you're explaining what you're thinking and why, why you're doing what you're doing, then you know, that, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, uh, Steve. Uh, your mic should open. Yeah, hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Perfect. Uh, just back to the uh, the atypical uh, chest pain presentations. Um, I guess vis-a-vis -vis, uh, any treatments that we'd give, uh, the, the indications are an alert patient experiencing chest pain consistent with that caused by cardiac ischemia or experiencing typical angina or MI pain. Um, with those atypical cases, uh, and that almost sounds like it would be precluded from treatment uh, by the protocol. I, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of a patch, but sometimes that, that may or may not be practical. It, is, is there consideration for, for one treatment or another, or just bring them in and, and let it be sorted out in the ER? I think, I think um, that, that's a really good question. I, I th I've seen that a lot. And what we've done um, locally here, which I think the other medical directors agree with me, is if you if you feel that in your experience as a medic, you know what, I think this is an acute coronary syndrome, and you just document, you know, uh, uh, symptoms consistent with acute coronary syndrome, and you go down that path, you know, if, if you're happy with it. I don't think we're looking to see um, the chest pain. I think what we, I think what we're looking to see is uh, if, you, if you, if in your mind you think it's acute coronary syndrome, then we're happy with that. We won't fault you on that ever. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. That's yeah, I just want to point on that. Uh, and like Dr. Bradford stated earlier, the, uh, like the most important uh, intervention there is the ASA. So, I mean, they don't have the classical test pain, but they have to slow the risk factors they're presenting as ACS and give, them, give the ASA in, in, in document as to why. If you can't, if yeah. you can't get in a patch. And I think, I think in cases like that, you know, even if you're wrong, the, uh, the, windows, the windows for the drugs that we're giving you keep you safe, right? And so. You know, I think uh, I don't think you're ever going to go wrong there, as long as we understand. Okay. That's, uh, um, and that was... All right. Okay, we got uh, one last hand up. Uh, John, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, you got Hello. a question, Paul and Tony? Yeah, gentlemen. Why is there such a reliance on the ten scale for pain? I mean, the, the tolerance level for many people is so different. Like uh, you get a World War II stoic veteran, he's not going to tell you it's a pain of 10. And that could mislead you if he says one, two, or, you know, nothing, for, for example. I'm confused on that, actually, at the 10 scale. Can you explain John? John? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. It's Tony. A um, little bit of issues with your microphone. It's coming in and coming out. Um, or if, are you using a headset right now? No, I'm not. No, I don't have a headset. Well, that's now. better. That's better now. That's better now. Go ahead with the question again. Okay, I'm confused with the 10 scale for pain uh, because the tolerance for each person is uh, considerably different. Like, for example, an old guy who has a pain tolerance so high, he, he might just say his pain scale is 1 or 2, and we discount that as a severe uh, onset of, uh, of a problem then? You know what, that's a really, really good point. And we see that a lot with trauma, as you probably know. And uh, uh, you see a lot of uh, differences uh, as people age. They feel, there's good evidence showing that they, that they feel um, less subjective pain. And in fact, it's a problem for surgery. And it's in a lot of surgical literature that, you know, we put their hands on their abdomen and see how tender they are. And, and, and they're more likely to miss 
uh, perforation, right? Because they don't they don't sense it as much. And um, and maybe as we get older, you know, it protects us from the agony of dying. <laughs> you know, we're getting old with our arthritis. I don't know, but, but there is there is certainly that effect. And there's also as you know, cultural differences and 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 uh, and how pains experienced or expressed. You know, I mean, anyone has worked on a res reservation. You know, like it's amazing the, the amount of pain that these uh, some of the native children have they have just a terrible ear, and yet. You know, my little brother screamed over anything. You know what I mean? So, so I think you're right. The problem with the the scales are, um, and there's been a lot of research on coming up with the you know different pain scales for different groups. The problem is trying to do that for pre-hospital care over all these different groups and validate it is difficult. So I think I think sort of the the ten pain scale is sort of the best thing we have, and that's why we're using it. But I think you know using your judgment and your experience, if you see some elderly person or you know you're in a situation where you know, in your experience culturally working where you're at, that you feel like and this person may be having more pain than, or they appear to be having more pain than, uh, than I think I think you're good to go with that. Good, okay. Well, uh, Stephanie Romano back here again, guys. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Dr. Bradford and to Tony for uh, another great webinar presentation. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see uh, many of you attendees again at our next one. Uh, once again, thank you very much, and uh, and we'll see you again. Take care. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Steph.